Welcome in to the PFF Podcast. Steve Palazzolo here with Sam Monson. We are talking NFC on this episode. We already have the AFC broken down every which way. Please check it out in the archive. Two separate episodes. We broke down every single team and their prospects for the 2017 season. Before we dive into each and every NFC team, we'll split it up. We'll do eight teams today and eight on a separate episode. But before we get into it, We've been touting our favorite new way to play fantasy football on the show for the last few weeks, and that's over at playdraft.com or draft in the App Store. It's called Best Ball, which means you're going to draft a team and then forget about it. You don't have to worry about waiver wire. You don't have to worry about trades. You don't even have to worry about your players getting hurt. Once your team is set, it'll take your best players every single week. It's a great format. The drafting is fun. And the best part about it is you can win real money. So you put up a little bit of money, and there is real prize money to be won. Uh, You can play at all different levels, $1 games, $3 games, $10, $100. Our friend Mike Renner claimed he was going to join a $100 league. We'll see if he really holds up to his end of the bargain. But we have a special offer for you this week. If you guys sign up, make your first deposit, use the promo code PFF, you'll get a free $3 $3 game. I highly suggest this. Games start every few minutes. You just join a league, and as soon as it's filled, boom, you're drafting. It could be a fast draft, which took me under an hour, or it can be a, a slow draft if you want to uh, take eight hours or so per pick. So a great way to play fantasy football. Even Sam over here, who's generally anti-fantasy football, is all in on this thing. He loves it too. So don't forget, promo code PFF. It's at playdraft.com or draft in your app store. Sam, do you have any general fantasy advice before we dive into the NFC? <laughs> yeah, my segment. Now, this is – I'm all on board. Anything that takes the uh, the weekly kind of tr- drudgery out of the fantasy thing, you just do it once, you set it up, and away you go. I like it. Yeah, it, it really is a great format. I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's pretty genius, so be sure to check it out. Okay, we're talking NFC. We're going team by team. We're trying to give you guys uh, some best case scenarios for these teams. Maybe, you know, what might uh, go wrong and, and just a general overview of what we think looking at these teams heading into the season. We're going to start in the NFC East and we're going to go by the standings. The defending NFC East champion, the Dallas Cowboys, who uh, certainly exceeded expectations last year mostly on the on the strength of Dak Prescott, rookie quarterback who comes out, has a fantastic season. Ezekiel Elliott, of course, uh, another great season at running back. We already know, as of now, he is slated to miss the first six games due to suspension, so there's something to discuss there. Uh, I think when you talk about Dallas, uh, you know, you start with those two guys, but then it creeps quickly to the offensive line. So as much as uh, Elliott and Dak, they were both really good last year, I think almost immediately in the same conversation you say, yeah, but they're playing behind one of the best offensive lines, if not the best, in the entire NFL. The defense, a bit of an overhaul in the secondary. We graded them pretty well as a secondary, but I, in Dallas fans are like, what are you talking about? We gave up all these yards. Uh, but that was just the thing. They had some busted coverages, and they, but they also had a lot of games that the, you know, teams just had to pass against them. So I don't think they were nearly as bad against the pass as maybe the stats will show. Let's start with just some general thoughts on the Cowboys, Sam, and and what you think their prospects are for this season. Can they duplicate uh, their 13-3 and season from last year? Yeah, I mean, we covered a lot of this on the the preseason review, uh, week one review podcast we did just a few days ago. Um, We're talking about Zeke Elliott and what the six games he's currently slated to miss is going to do that offense and, you know, getting a glimpse of Darren McFadden and Alfred Morris um, and Rod Smith, those guys in the backfield through one or through two preseason games for Dallas um, and and what that means. And I think they'll actually be okay in the backfield. McFadden won't be anything special, but Alfred Morris, I think is a pretty capable back. If he gets given the bulk of the Zeke Elliott carries, I think he's, he's, he's effectively a poor man's Zeke Elliott. He can do, Pretty much everything Elliott can do, just not as well. Um, and like you say, it's going to come down to the offensive line, which for the past few years has been seen as the best offensive line in the NFL. They've definitely been there or thereabouts for all of the past few years. But there's a bit of 
flux to this unit now. It's not the same five guys we've come to expect. There's now a couple of positions that are question marks. You still have all pro Tyron Smith at left tackle, all pro Travis Frederick at center, and all pro Zach Martin at right guard. So that's always going to be a pretty good starting point. But now you've got the question mark at right tackle of how Lyle Collins does kicking out there to replace Doug Free, who's retired. And then you've got whoever is going to start at left guard filling in for, for Collins or for the departed Ron Leary. Um, it's, it looks like it's going to be Jonathan Cooper at the moment. Um, Cooper has done nothing so far to suggest that he'll be any better than he's been in the past, which has been not particularly good. But even if it's not him, whether it's Chaz Green or, you know, there, there's just no clear answer at left guard. What we settled on is, you know, so far, Collins has looked pretty good at right tackle. Now, it's only preseason. There's, there's plenty of caveats there. But if he's anything approaching average, that offensive line will be one of the best in the league again, even if Jonathan Cooper or, or whoever's a left guard is, is a bit of a disaster. You know, three and a half top quality players is fine for an offensive line to be very good. You can patch up one bad spot. Um, they only have problems if Collins ends up struggling badly at right tackle and suddenly they have two holes to patch up. But if that line, again, is one of the better units in the league, Dak Prescott, I think, is a lot better than a lot of people want to give him credit for in terms of being a product of that offense. I really don't think he is. You know, he's had a fantastic situation to walk into as a rookie, but that's not the reason he played really well. You know what I mean? There's there's a bit of both in there. It's it's a great situation to land in, but if you suck, you're not going to look good despite the great situation. So he's going to have to shoulder more of the burden in year two. And then it's a case of, you know, whether they can get through the six weeks fine without Zeke Elliott. Even with Zeke missing games, I thought coming into the season, it would be a little bit more on Dak's shoulders because look, I'm not saying he's Tom Brady or Russell Wilson or Ben Roethlisberger, but I think there is a comparison to be made when you look at Brady, Roethlisberger and Wilson they stepped into pretty favorable situations when you talk about supporting cast, both on their side of the ball and the other side of the ball. They both, uh, they all headed up teams that, that won games early in their career. And you might say, well, Brady didn't have a ton on his plate real early in his career, if you guys can remember back that far. Uh, same thing with Roethlisberger. I mean, Roethlisberger's Super Bowl, Super Bowl win, I mean, he did absolutely nothing during that. And even the entire run, uh, his first two years, they won a ton of games. Uh, with him literally just being a game manager. And while Russell, Russell Wilson, I don't think, ever was a true game manager, he was put into favorable situations. You know, it's a run-heavy attack, a lot of play action, and a great defense. So I think Dak, from that perspective, you could say was put into a great perspe- uh, great situation, but he did perform. But when you compare to those other quarterbacks as Brady, Wilson, Roethlisberger, as those guys got older and progressed, they had a lot more on their plate. And they had games where... You know, hey, obviously Brady goes out and wins games with his arm. Roethlisberger can do the same. Wilson can do the same. I'm not saying Dak didn't do that ever last year, but I do think that there's there's this element of, all right, we we've saw what you could do in year one. You know, I think Dak can, uh, you know, run you know run the short and intermediate pass game and and kind of be the guy and not have to rely solely on the running game week in week out. So I do think there'll be more on his plate when you have guys like Cole Beasley who get open, have a good rapport with Dak. You have uh, a Jason Witten who you, you can trust to get open in the short game and then stretch the field just a little bit with Des Bryant and Ter- Terrence Williams. Keep an eye on Ryan Switzer, their first, uh, sorry, fourth-round pick, but a rookie who uh, looks a lot like Cole Beasley as far as style goes out of the slot. So, I don't know. I think you could put a lot more on Dak's plate. And, you know, if if it is McFadden and Morris splitting carries, you don't have to rely on those guys as much as you normally would rely on Zeke. But the bottom line is this offense should be good, whatever happens, you know, even if they're missing Zeke Elliott for six weeks. What we've seen between the offensive line, between the weapons they've got, it should be a very good offense. The question marks are going to be how defense performs. So defensively, the number that stands out, and this is not all because they're just bad up front, but they pressured the quarterback 27% of the time last year. That is second lowest in the NFL. Only the Colts got fewer pressures per snap than the Cowboys. Now, they do a lot of three-man rushing and four-man rushing, and they're a team that will will say, look, we're going to trust our guys on the back end a little bit more. 
But at the same time, it's not like they have a bunch of studs up front that are getting after the quarterback. That's why they went and drafted Taco Charlton in the first round. So I think it's crucial. You need guys like Demarcus Lawrence, like Tyrone Crawford, like a Taco Charlton. Uh, you, you need Malik Collins on the interior in his second season to really step up and provide a pass rush because, you know, that's it's such a huge part. I mean, even if they get up to average as a pass rushing unit instead of second worst, that would be a, a, just a massive step for this defense. Yeah, and, and I don't think they're going to be able to lean on those defensive banks as much as they did last year. You know, we talked about the kind of the difference between how we were grading them and the overall numbers that they gave up a ton of passing yards. Um, but individually, a lot of those guys are playing quite well. They were just put in ugly situations, and they were put in ugly situations a lot, which led to a lot of yardage being racked up on them. But a lot of those guys are gone now. Um, you know, Morris Claiborne spent years playing badly, finally snapped into the player that everybody thought he would be when they drafted him. Um, number six overall, was it, Bank? Five years ago? It was four. I think it was four. Actually. Four, wow. Um, but anyway, he, he finally showed that play for like six games, got injured, but now he's gone. Um, so now they're, you know, they're projected to start a bunch of guys that look not ideal on paper. Orlando Skandrick is a good cornerback, but he's better in the slot. It's, you know, he wouldn't, he wouldn't be a standout number one for anybody when you're asking him to be a starter on the outside and then kick inside, presumably in nickel situations. Nolan Carroll came across from Philadelphia who have one of the worst cornerback stables in the entire NFL. And then you're relying on a couple of young guys, um, rookies in particular, getting things very quickly in terms of Jordan Lewis um, and Awuzie. There's, I mean, that's a very, very sketchy-looking secondary on paper. It, it kind of goes back to what we said about the Raiders, right? The Raiders have all this youth in the secondary, but you might not you might not look at the Raiders' secondary and say, hey, this looks like a really good unit until maybe two or three years from now. I love the way the Cowboys have moved as far as the rebuild goes, but I think to your point, to count on Jordan Lewis, to count on Awuzie, Keep an eye on Xavier Woods as well, who was a team of the week safety after preseason week one. A guy we had as more of a second or third round type of player coming out of the draft. He went in the fifth round. He looked great. Uh, his first, uh, not week, well, their second game because they played the Hall of Fame game. But against the Rams, Xavier Woods looked great. Making plays all over the field. Had six stops. Didn't miss a tackle. Was making some big open field tackles as well. What I do like about all these guys, Jordan Lewis is, is a guy I think can cover outside or in the slot. Awuzie, same thing, did the same thing in college. Woods did the same thing. He was a safety slash slot corner. You have a guy like Byron Jones, who's a safety by name, but they will just man him up against tight ends and slot receivers and let him uh, be kind of a versatile defensive type of uh, chess piece. I like the versatility that they've added on the back end. Then you have guys like Sean Lee in the front, uh, you know, in the front seven that are really good coverage players. I do think that the potential is there, but uh, you know, from a grading standpoint, PFF grading standpoint, could also see that step back this year, especially if the pass rush does not, you know, really take a big step forward. Yeah, the difference between them and the Raiders for me is that with Oakland, it's a case of are the young players going to get it quickly enough to still get to, to, to be good at the same time as the older guys, you know, or are, is it going to take too long so that by the time those young guys are playing well, the old guys start to fall off and you've still got an incomplete secondary, either way it works. This team, I mean, this secondary is almost all on the youth. It's just a case of can can enough of those young guys get good that this will be a good secondary? And if they can, can they get, when, how long is it going to take? Because I just, I don't see any way that all of them get good enough this year for that to be a particularly good secondary. And then you're still relying on basically, you know, three or four of those guys realizing their potential in the next couple of years to be a good secondary at all, which is, I mean, it's doable, but it's a big ask in terms of expecting that many young guys to all turn out to be successes. Just in terms of the odds of draft picks and that kind of thing, it seems like a, a slim chance. So I, I think it's fair to say Dallas is set for a regression. I mean, just just the fact that they went 13-3 and three last year, which was overachieving, uh, all the turnover in the secondary, the question marks in the defensive, in the offensive backfield with with Zeke, and as much as we've talked up Dak, he still very much outperformed the way he played in college. There's still a part of me that wants him to continue 
to prove himself. As as impressed as I was with his rookie season, and I think he'll be a good player. I think he'll continue to be a good player. Still want to kind of see him prove himself. So I'm expecting a regression from the Cowboys this season. Uh, second place in the division last year, the New York Giants, they overachieved as well. That defense really, really turned things around, particularly in the secondary. They were one of the most fun defenses to watch last season. When you talk about the free agent signing of Janoris Jenkins, who uh, really outplayed his you know, his previous performances, his entire career. Uh, so I don't know if this is a career year, if it's just the new system, the new, the new scheme, but Janoris Jenkins looked really, really good. Landon Collins, Defensive Player of the Year candidate, one of the best safeties in the entire NFL. Uh, they grabbed Olivier Vernon from the Miami Dolphins, and he has a solid year as a very, very high-priced free agent. And then offensively, I think we're looking at a team, it's going to be fascinating because Eli Manning, uh, he just he looks like an aging Manning. You can tell that the arm is disappearing a little bit. He's not the same guy, and but he has enough playmakers. He has all these playmakers to throw the ball to. I think it's going to come down to that offensive line and the running game. What are your what are your thoughts on the Giants as a whole when you're looking at this roster and uh, how they're going to look this season? Yeah, I've, I've touched on the Eli Manning thing a few times, and I don't want to go too hard on it. I'm don't beat a dead horse, but I'm, I'm well, and also I'm gun shy with the Tom Brady thing. I don't want to declare people done until it's it's beyond doubt, and I can't be proven wrong for years to come. At least you have but, some physical evidence, just just the velocity on his throws and some of the stuff that you can actually see on the field with Eli last season here's uh, the is thing. a little concerning. Quarterbacks used to get old and retire at the age Eli Manning is. And if you look at that class of 2004, Ben, ben Roethlisberger is talking about retirement openly. Phil Rivers isn't really, but there's a lot of conversations about, you know, can the Chargers get Rivers and Antonio Gates a Super Bowl ring before the inevitable happens. And Eli Manning has been playing some of the worst football of his entire career over the past year or so. So those guys are at that age where quarterbacks used to decline and fall off a cliff and retire. And only guys like Tom Brady playing until he's 48 years old and Peyton Manning going until every single part of his body fell off him have kind of adjusted everyone's expectations. And now we're all expecting quarterbacks to go till they're 40 if they're good enough. But we might have just reached the point where Eli Manning is now an old, busted, broken-down quarterback. Um I think it's a very real possibility. I don't, given he's he's been moved to this offense um, that gives him a lot of easy manufactured throws and yardage, and it means that his numbers, at least some of his numbers, look very healthy in terms of total yards and all that kind of stuff. But the play is it's just bad. It's getting worse, if not if if anything. And it's ironic because the Giants have finally now put together a defense that looks like one of the best in the league. Like you said, they surrounded him with weapons. The offensive line obviously is still a problem, but like this is as good a supporting cast as Eli Manning has ever had. And he may now be the biggest problem on that roster compared with, you know, the years like 2011 where Eli Manning dragged that team to the Super Bowl based on some ridiculous play under pressure. Um, it, it's just, it's a fascinating kind of switch in, in dynamics there. Yeah, so his 70.5 overall grade, so the PFF grade that I'm pulling from, PFF Edge, which you can find on ProFootballFocus.com, his 2016 grade, 70.5, that is the lowest grade we have for him since 2006. Uh, his peak in our grading, 2011 and 2012, where he was among the league's best. Other than that, uh, pretty much slightly above average quarterback for the majority of his career last year, subpar play from Eli Manning and and you hit the nail on the head there were so many plays where it was just two yard slant to Odell Beckham who outruns the defense and Eli has a 50 yard touchdown and uh, you know I, he really held that offense back I think last season now I'm going to yeah. make the excuses for him though okay <laughs> he's working with three wide receiver sets the entire time 91 percent of the time they ran 11 personnel that's three receivers one tight end one running back they have no running game to speak of and that's in part because of their running back situation and an offensive line that is among the worst in the NFL. So while we can see Eli Manning regressing, and he still throws way too many passes into coverage, and his accuracy is not great, and he doesn't have the zip to drive the ball down the field as consistently as he did previously in his career, you have to give him 
a little bit of a pass because of the offensive line in the run game. Yeah, I mean, so Odell Beckham broke 29 tackles last year after the catch, which led the NFL by six for wide receivers. It's it, incredible. I mean, there's a huge amount of stuff. Anyway, the point is, I think there's a very real chance that his grade has declined the past two years in a row. I think there's a pretty good chance that he is <laughs> done and that we have seen the best of Eli Manning in the past. We're not going to see some kind of late career reversal the way we saw with Tom Brady, who goes back to his very best. I think this could be the beginning of the end for Eli Manning, at which point their backup quarterback situation becomes interesting because you've got Josh Johnson, who you know is never going to be much in the NFL. You've got Geno Smith, the great reclamation project, who had the most Geno Smith game ever in the preseason where everything looked good right up until the point you throw through the ball right to a defender. Um, and then you've got Davis Webb, who is a guy that has – he's the guy that you would draw up to look like an NFL quarterback, but you know, in terms really. of – Exactly. Really. We talked about him. If you guys are – the BTT, the Big Time Throwcast, which is here on the Pro Podcast, Zach Robinson and I did talk about Davis Webb's debut the other night. It was not pretty. No, but, but he does have all those tools. You know, he's the guy that when you ask those scouts to draw up exactly what they want an NFL quarterback to look like – they're going to come up with something that looks an awful lot like Davis Webb. So the question is, can Eli Manning hang on long enough that they can actually develop Davis Webb, assuming he does develop? You know, maybe he can be that guy that steps in to to replace Manning in a year or two. Um, But the defense is what's going to have to carry this team. And, you know, last year was phenomenal. Between the the front four and the secondary, the linebackers still pretty much suck. Uh, But everything either side of the linebackers... 2005, yeah. six, four, <laughs> but everything either side whatever. of those linebackers is fantastic. Um, the Janoris Jenkins thing, though, is the one that fascinates me the most because last year was a career year, and it wasn't just you know a, a minor step forward in his ability. His the the, num- the difference in his numbers every year with the Rams and that year with the Giants are just ridiculous. Like his completion percentage dropped like 11 points from a career from the best career percentage he had before. The best mark he'd ever had was as a rookie where he allowed 61.7% of passes thrown his way to be caught. Last year it was 50. So his you know his career average is still 63.2 even even including last year. Um the passer rating he allowed dropped like 30 points from his career best as well. So you're just it's just a completely different guy. I mean he went one on one with Des Bryant, completely shut the guy down, allowed one catch for seven yards, and on that catch he forced a fumble as soon as he actually made contact with him. This was a guy that took a step forward and legitimately looked like a number one shutdown corner. He has the same thing as, as a, a key to leave for me in terms of I have no idea if you can trust on that to repeat itself in 2017. And that is such a huge thing for, for any defense, getting a guy that can be a true number one shutdown corner. The Giants had one last year. I don't know if that same guy is going to be able to do it again this year. Yeah, I just and you're right. I mean, when you when you look at numbers like that, you generally should skew to the bigger sample size. But I also look at scheme and the fact that you know throughout much of his career with the, with the Rams, he was playing a lot more zone, a lot softer coverage. They used him in a lot more you know man to man situations last year. You know the fact that he could man up on one side and they used Dominique Rogers Cromarty and moved him around. Uh, Eli Apple, I thought, was one of the better just pure man corners coming out of the draft in 2016, and he had his rookie ups and downs, but I think I, I think even if Janoris takes a step back, I'm expecting Eli Apple to take a bit of a step forward, and I still like the way they're set up in the secondary, and then you look at Landon Collins, may not be a more fun player to watch in the entire NFL because he could be a box safety, he could cover in the slot, he did a little bit as a deep safety last year. But, man, when you watch him just work downhill, run game, pass game, he is just a playmaker. So if Collins keeps that up, I kind of like what they have in the secondary this year. But overall, I kind of see a regression from the Giants, too. I'm just going to hate on the entire NFC East. I I, I could see them also taking a step back. I just think the Giants and Cowboys both overachieved last year for reasons like you're saying. Janoris Jenkins comes out of nowhere, and, well, the Giants knew something. They paid him, but... He comes out of nowhere and has this career year. Can these guys maintain what they did last season? That's the big question. Uh, Going back to Eli real quick, I 
I don't think we're talking about his demise this year. I think he still has a chance to put up a ton of good numbers. You have Odell Beckham, who we talked about. You have Sterling Shepard, who just does, it's tough to cover. Whether he's in the slot or outside, he gets open. You have Brandon Marshall now as a contested catch guy. They drafted Evan Ingram. You're talking about four legitimate mismatch playmakers. If that offensive line can just hold up for 2.2 seconds, Eli's going to have either somebody open or Brandon Marshall to throw the ball up to. I think statistically Eli might be fine, even if the physical tools or even the PFF grade is diminishing. I think the I think the playmakers are in place to make him look really good this year. Yeah, I mean, it kind of depends what you term as the true demise. I mean, I could see him playing exceptionally badly and still putting up some pretty good base numbers. Well, you know, that's what so. I'm saying. Like, ultimately, all the Giants care about is that the results are there, right? I mean, but even I mean, he may not win the games because of it, but he may put up a ton of yardage because he's just going to be passing all day long. Um, one other random thing about this team is how unfortunate has Andrew Adams got to feel? He played fantastically as the deep safety last year, got the opportunity because Darian Thompson got injured and the door got open for him, but really played excellent stuff. And given that they were, I mean, same draft class, Andrew Adams was undrafted, right? Um, I don't know. I, I would have said that that half a year of play would, in the NFL would trump three years of college football where you evaluate one guy as better than the other, but didn't seem to get a sniff this year in terms of that starting job, which is handed straight back to Thompson. Yeah, I still like Thompson and his potential. And Oh, I do too. I just think that Adams is – No, Adams did well. I would feel a little hard done by. No, I hear you. And he did well, and that adds, you know, that adds some more depth to the secondary. That's why I think – I think they'll be pretty good. So, Giants, do you think they maintain, like, how many wins are you looking at for the Giants? Do you think they're a, they're not an 11-win team, are they? Are they a 9-win team? Where do you see them end up, uh, ending up? Rough. I think that, yeah, I think that defense will be really good, and I think there's enough talent in the offense. They, they, they'll be chasing double digits. I don't, I think they're around that 10-win mark, and then, you know, we'll see where they go up or down from there. I think that's fair. Let's go to the Washington Redskins, 8, 7, and 1. <laughs> Last season, third place, One. and in the NFC East, do you like the ties? You're European. No. You like? Ties. No, I hate ties. Oh. Well, I wouldn't mind ties if you got rid of the overtime. Like, just if you're going to accept ties exist, then just end it at, re- at the end of the regular. If you can't win regulation, you don't deserve overtime. Just be done with it. If, no, see, if that- we're doing it more like we hate ties. We got to give them a chance to untie, but then there's this point where you just can't let them play football forever, so they have to tie. Well then, it, see that's the thing, right? If you hate ties, figure out a way of deciding it. Don't don't give me this period of overtime, and then oh, we're gonna tie it anyway. What did Renner come up with? Some sort of like skills test or shootout or hockey uh, shootout? Renner's, you know, Renner's idea was you make a set of two point conversion attempts, essentially, like a penalty shootout or two point conversion attempts. Fascinating. I would hate the actual be- game to come down to a bunch of two point conversions, but I feel the same way about hockey. I think that's awesome. Penalty shootouts are the single best thing about soccer. And everyone acts like, oh, nobody wants it to come down to this. Everybody wants it to come down to this because that's the single most dramatic moment of a soccer game. I'm not saying Everybody, they're not fun or dramatic. I just don't want the re- the entire result, win or lose, to come down to, to that. It, you're, you're taking me off the rails here, Sam. I know. It comes down to single plays anyway. You might as well make them structured two-point conversion single plays. It's a difference. Playmakers make plays as Jack Farrell would tell us. All right, so, okay, what do you think about Washington? A lot of drama here, Kirk Cousins. Let me just sum up my Kirk Cousins take really quickly. I think he's a solid quarterback. I think he's continued to improve year in, year out. I think statistically, where if you look at his stats, he looks great. He looks really, really good. I don't think his stats have matched up his play the last couple of years, and I think he's been uh, the same thing I was just saying about Eli Manning. I think Kirk Cousins has really been elevated by his playmakers, Deshaun Jackson as a deep threat, Pierre Garçon as one of the better pure just possession receivers in the NFL, and Jordan Reed, one of the best tight end mismatches in the league. And don't forget Jamison Crowder and how much he creates out of the slot. He just can run routes and get open. So I look at Cousins and think he's kind of been elevated by those guys, and now you have Pierre Garçon and Deshaun Jackson moving on, guys like Terrell Pryor, Josh Doxson stepping in. I think there are some question marks there. Offensive line has continued to improve every single year. Still some questions with the running game and, uh, you know, defensively, uh, question marks if they can get after the quarterback. 
consistently enough. Where do you stand on Washington's chances this year? I am just perpetually fascinated at the sheer volume of money that the Redskins are throwing at Kirk Cousins while deciding whether he's worth big money. I mean, right? <laughs> it's just this is never-ending sequence of 20 plus million dollar checks getting sent his way while they tread water to decide if he's worth actually getting 20 million dollars a season. And if they end up franchising him again next year, it's like $34 million or something. If they do it next year, they will have given him $72 million over three seasons while they decide if he's worth paying big money contract to. While they were that, deciding if he was worth like $60 million guaranteed for six yeah. years or whatever it is. Yes. Which would just be absolutely mind-blowing. Um, I agree with you. I think that the situation there in terms of playmakers has really helped him out. Um, it, it's an interesting receiving core because they've kind of completely overhauled it. You know, they've sent away a bunch of guys, but they've also got, between bringing in a guy like Terrell Pryor and hopefully seeing Josh Doxson for the first time in, you know, actuality in the NFL, it's got the potential to kind of just sidestep, you know what I mean? Be the same dangerous group of receivers as it was a year ago, just a completely different set of guys. Um, so I think that offense should be pretty good. Running back is still really a bit of a mess. It's just a group of guys, none of whom are particularly talented, none of whom are particularly um, assured or you would be confident in. And I think that's the biggest problem on the offense. The offensive line is, is coming pretty good. Kirk Cousins, I think, is just going to be a solid player for his entire career. He's almost... I mean, he's a completely different style player to Alex Smith with the same kind of deal where you, you, you know what you're going to get pretty much every season and you kind of build around this guy. And then again, this is another team where the defense is going to be the thing that kind of determines how good they're really going to be. And they've already had some injuries um, in terms of losing guys for the season. Trent Murphy down for the year. Um, that's a big loss for them. Huge. With, with but, how, how much he stepped up last year, whether it was – you know, PED induced or not, he did have a good season, his best season last year. Yeah, um, so I think that's a big loss for them opposite Ryan Kerrigan. Um, and there's a lot of moving places with this team, moving Sua Cravens to safety full time. There's a lot of kind of guys where you're 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 looking how this is going to perform, but up front is just a real like everybody that's that seems to have talent on that defense seems to be buried further down the depth chart. You know, the guys that are actually scheduled to start look, I mean, ugly. <laughs> it doesn't look good. Well, I think Jonathan Allen will be in there sooner than later. Yes. I don't know what, you know, whether you call him a starter or a backup, he's going to see significant snaps. But when you look at the guys potentially slated to see snaps, Ziggy Hood, Phil Taylor, Stacy McGee, I mean, this has been – other than really Chris Baker, who's no longer with the team the last few years, this has been a big question mark. They play this, I mean, in, it's it's called a 3-4. Their front three has not been good the last few years, and that's why they go out and draft a guy like Jonathan Allen. So it, it is a big question mark. In a 3-4, in theory, you don't need guys that are dominant up front, but these guys aren't necessarily great against the run. They're not going to really rush the passer other than a guy like Allen. You know you have Kerrigan off the edge. Who's who's creating that pressure off the other edge? Is it is it Preston Smith? Are you going to see second round pick Ryan Anderson playing a lot more snaps? I, I think it. I think the front seven will determine a lot for Washington. And I, I have my questions. I hate every NFC team and NFC East team so far, Sam. A lot of questions you know who, here. You know who needs more snaps for this team? Who? Uh, defensive and Anthony Lanier. Lanier. I don't know how you pronounce that guy's second name, but. Um, we saw this guy on the training camp tour last year, and just from one practice, he stood out. He looked like the only guy on that defensive line who was capable of winning one-on-one -on -one against the offensive line. Looked to be a kind of <laughs> classic high-motor guy, but a guy that was going to get... Jeez, um, Sam, are you, you are just racking up PFF fines left and right. You just did... I was there scouting, so you were there that yep. one day that he was good. Was. Then you dropped a high-motor on us on a guy that has 48 snaps in his entire career. Yeah, carry on. Ah, you're forgetting about the preseason, though. Last year's preseason, this guy racked up seven total pressures, had a really good grade across 126 preseason snaps. 
And this year, he's had 30 snaps, got a sack and a hurry already. Again, a good pass rushing grade. This guy can get you interior pressure. He is a guy who you need to get on the field this year. 48 snaps is nothing. Forget about that. Go into 2017, put him out on the field, and let him get some sub-package interior pressure. Man, look, I don't mind you pulling out a nice uh, super sleeper here, but you're still going into the fine book for the way you That's fine. for the way you approach it. Hey, I, I look, it's worth a shot. It's not like they are stellar up front and they have a bunch of guys who are great. Ziggy Hood, man, he um, hasn't had a whole lot of good years in the old PFF system since coming into the league in 2009. And I think losing Chris Baker, who was, like I said, their most consistent interior player the last couple of years could hurt them. So the defense, big question mark. You still have Josh Norman on the back end who has his ups and downs, but overall still a pretty good playmaker. What are your thoughts opposite Josh Norman? Again, I think we trust Norman more often than not, but you got Bashad Breland has had just his ups and downs too. Some days he looks great, big corner that can make some plays. Other days he gets torched. Kendall Fuller uh, on the verge of being released last reports that we've heard is a 2016 third round pick. Is that right? I mean, he's never really panned out. So I think there's still too many question marks at corner. Yeah. And I wasn't wild on Fuller coming out. Um, you so weren't, it, I know it's, it's definitely, I'm, I'm not surprised by that. I, yeah, I, I think it is a big question mark opposite Norman who himself was not the same guy as we saw in Carolina. Um, you know, he just didn't have nearly the same, a bit, the same kind of, lockdown play I think he still made a lot of plays in terms of I think he almost matched the number of uh, total kind of interceptions and pass defenses he had the year before in fact I think he had one more overall even if it was one fewer interception but he was just beaten a lot worse um, you know gave up more yardage a lot more yards per catch that went up almost in fact went up more than four yards per catch he allowed um, allowed more yards after the catch so you know, it wasn't that he wasn't making plays. It was that he was just allowing far, ma- far more catches than he did the year before. He was getting beaten more often. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if he can cut that down in 2017 and start getting back to how he was the, the year before in Carolina that got him paid. But yeah, outside of Norman, there, there's just not any guy you can be truly confident in if you're the Washington Redskins. Um, and I don't see an obvious answer. You know, on the roster, there's nobody, there's no super sleeper like, uh, like old Lanier there. I really need to learn that guy's name if I'm going to start pimping him out as a, yeah, if that's a guy that guy. should be. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really rule one of your guys. You should know their name, um, or at least how to say their name. And you give me so much crap for not being able to pronounce names. It's all right, though. Uh, well, look, we some of the on. names you can't pronounce. Look, some of the names. <laughs> you really should know how to pronounce. I don't want to talk about it. Before we move on from Washington, I just want to give them a little bit of credit on their offensive line. Trent Williams, our top-graded offensive tackle last season. Uh, look, that's a little bit – he's been good his entire career. That was a little bit of an anomaly, so I don't know if he's – is he back? Is he a top-three tackle? Will he regress a little bit back to what he was? Still a very good player. Uh, Morgan Moses, one of the best right tackles in the entire NFL. They paid him. Brandon Scherf developing nicely at guard. So they're developing that offensive line. Again, I think that goes back to – uh, Kirk Cousins' supporting cast is really coming together. But, look, the more I break down this NFC East, the more question marks I see, the more wide open this division looks. Let's go to Philadelphia, which, when I look at this roster, Sam, the last couple of years, when we do roster rankings, whether it's for ESPN, whether it's on PFF, we've done a lot of these things. We run the numbers, and the Eagles roster, just top to bottom, unit by unit, always looks good. Right, Our numbers on the offensive line usually look good, and the defensive line. And I think Eagles fans are always like, what are you talking about? There's no way our team is this good. And I don't blame them because here's the issue. They're bad in the wrong places, in my opinion. In today's NFL, they're bad at receiver and cornerback. And even if your offensive line is great, even if your pass rush is good, they can only do so much if you can't cover. So... That's what I think about the Eagles here. If you just look at their roster on paper, you go player by player, unit by unit, it, it comes out pretty good as a roster, but still major question marks at corner, major question marks at receiver, maybe just beyond Alshon Jeffrey. 
Yeah, I think they might actually have fixed the receiver problems. Um, not all the way, but Alshon they Jeffrey makes better. a huge difference. They should be better for sure. Mike Collins looks like a guy that can make an impact. Love I'm, that. St- I'm still not a hundred percent ready to write off Nelson Aguilar. Such was the love I had for him coming out as a draft prospect, though I admit it has been horrendous in the NFL. It's been but I, I still think that there's something there. We can we can salvage Nelson. Um, and then Torrey Smith is what Torrey Smith is, which is a guy that's going to run deep down the field and be open every now and again that might be useful. But I think there's some weapons there. You know, it's not this disastrous-looking receiving core that is going to hold Carson Wentz back. It's not enough to be an excuse anymore. I think there's definitely uh, some talent there. <clears throat> and then they they really went hard to address that cornerback problem by getting a guy like Ronald Darby, who I think is a perfect fit in that scheme. Um, I don't think he was a great fit in Buffalo's. I think he's a, you know, they've, they've got players there that are not going to be, now they've got one corner and a problem. You know what I mean? Before they had no corners and everything was a problem. But now they've at least got one guy that you, that you can be confident in surviving one-on-one against receivers, and you've just got to try and find the other guys that can match up because the safeties are pretty good. Um, there's a lot of talent in the front seven, and there's some guys that can cover in, in the linebacking core, which is huge to try and kind of bolster a secondary that's struggling. I think this whole roster actually is in far better shape now than it has been in the past. Do you think, I mean, the more we talk talk through this, that people are sleeping on the Eagles a little bit then? I mean, again, when I look at Dallas, on paper, I don't think they should have done what they did last year. The Giants probably shouldn't have been an 11-win team last year either. Washington, we just talked about their question marks on defense. I mean, is are people sleeping on the Eagles? And, you know, their team, they pressured the quarterback seventh highest percentage in the league last year. They add Derek Barnett, who we know just had a very productive college career, who we loved, first-round pick. I mean, are they in position to kind of sneak up on the rest of the NFC this year? I don't want to say yes, because it seems like every year the Eagles are a sleeper pick and it never quite works out. But <laughs> it really Except kind the of looks like it. Yes. Um, but it really does look like it. They they have been a good roster for years, but like you said, they were just bad in the wrong areas to be bad. But I think they've definitely improved both those areas, and they've done it without weakening everything else. I mean, if anything, they've gotten stronger in the areas they were already good in, in terms of adding Derek Barnett. Chris Long you know, can bring some pressure still as a situational guy. They've got him on the roster as well. There is... There should be a huge amount of pressure coming from that front seven. Like the, the linebackers can cover. There is some talent in the secondary. They just haven't had cornerbacks. I think this is a team where the defense should suddenly look actually quite good. And there's enough of, there's enough weaponry in, in the offense that if Carson Wentz, he, he had such a weird rookie season because for like five weeks, he was, I think, the second best graded quarterback in the league at PFF behind Derek Carr. And then, from like that point on, he was like 32. It was just a disaster from then on. It was com- it was a complete about face, and it happened like over a weekend. Um, I don't I don't think he was ever really playing that well either. He was ne- he was never really playing as well as the grade showed, in my opinion. I thought he looked good. I didn't think he looked that great. What he was doing was avoiding negative throws. He was just yes. he wasn't missing, which a is a huge throws. thing. No, it is, but it was also. Not really sustainable, and I think that was a big part of of why he regressed. A lot of people will point to early in the year, played the Browns, played the Bears. I didn't think that was a huge factor. If you look at some of the throws he made in those games, tight window throws. A tight window throw is tight window whether you're playing a bad Browns defense or a bad Seahaw- or a good Seahawks defense. doesn't matter. Um, I just thought that the regression was kind of inevitable for Wentz. So a lot of question marks with him coming into year two as well. I mean, I think the, the regression was definitely inevitable, but the way it went for it to happen basically overnight, and the severity of it was weird. So well, It did, it did coincide it? with losing Lane Johnson at right tackle. And Obviously going to be a problem, yeah. Speaking of pronunciations, can you pronounce Vitae's first name for me? Uh, Big V. Big V, okay. Big V, the Vitae who took over at right tackle, you could kind of see the trust diminishing you know, with, the, with the Eagles offense. They were not trusting him. They were trying to get rid of the ball much quicker. Now, when Lane Johnson's healthy and Jason Peters is healthy and Jason Kelsey, Brandon Brooks, it's a pretty decent offensive line across the board. 
Yeah, I'll also say that Vitae actually came on quite well. He just, I mean, he was just horrendous to begin with. But the longer he played, he actually became not decent, but he became fine. I mean, if you ran into the season, yeah, if if you ran into the season right now based on how Vitae has been playing, I think he'd be okay. So (laughs) the the next time Lane Johnson inevitably gets himself suspended, (laughs) they're they're actually going to be in better shape. (laughs) Predicting the next Lane Johnson suspension. Uh, so, yeah, Eagles, a very interesting team. I, I want to see what Wentz does in year two. Uh, need more consistency out of him. I didn't think he drove the ball down the field as well as he should have given that big arm. When you have a guy like Alshon Jeffrey, Jeffrey needs a kind of a, a risk taker, a quarterback, to give him a chance, kind of like when you're dealing with Brandon Marshall, you know, their f- former teammates. You need that Jay Cutler type of guy to just be like, go go get the ball, Alshon. We'll see if Wentz... Uh, has that trust because there will be some big plays to be made by Alshon Jeffrey. You need some uh, some YOLO throws, is that what you're saying? Yes, YOLO throws. Get Connor Cook over here for some YOLO balls. Give Alshon Jeffrey a chance to make plays. Uh, keep an eye on that defensive front. Like you said, Brandon Graham, the inevitable 800 pressures, only six sacks guy, sack guys. I still think one of these years Brandon Graham is going to sneak 15 sacks. And everybody's <laughs> going to be like, look at this breakout, and we're going to say, no, since 2010 we were telling you about Brandon Graham, he just doesn't finish his pressures one of these years, he will. But Brandon Graham, Fletcher Cox, Derek Barnett, you mentioned Chris Long, they got some guys that can get after the quarterback. Timmy Jernigan, you over. Ah, Timmy Jernigan's a nice pick as well. Man, I'm talking myself into the Eagles this year, sneaking up on the NFC East. Let's go over to the West. I don't know why we did it in the AFC podcast. We did East and West, but let's just do East and West. Seattle Seahawks, they're the uh, the pride of the NFC West almost every year. 10-5 and 1 last season. Speaking of interesting roster construction, it's all, it's almost the opposite of the Eagles, right? Because you look at their offensive line and it's just it's bottom 3 in the NFL, but does it even matter when you have Russell Wilson throwing to a solid receiving core and it it doesn't matter. You just make up for the fact that he's under pressure all the time. If any quarterback can handle consistent pressure, it is Russell Wilson. He did so last year on a bad ankle early in the season, and you can kind of see his play get better and better as the year progressed. Uh, Defensively, still a big question mark opposite Richard Sherman, that number two cornerback spot. But you have Sherman back, you have Cam Chancellor, you have Earl Thomas, you have Bobby Wagner, Michael Bennett, Cliff Averill. The stars are still in place in Seattle, are are they due for a regression at any time, or are they still the pride of the West and a Super Bowl contender? It really is fascinating how they have built that team. I mean, they claim it isn't a deliberate attempt to basically put no resources whatsoever into the offensive line. Oh, it's deliberate. Um, That's pretty deliberate. It has to be. I mean, you can't accidentally stumble your way into a line that looks like that and and coincidentally has no money in it. Um, Though, you know, they have a first-round pick and Jermaine Effetti, a second-round pick now and Ethan. Did we decide how that guy's name was pronounced? Posich? I think, I think I've decided on Posich. All right, I'll go with that. Posich. Um, so there's there's some draft picks in there, just not an awful lot of money. Um, but, you know, we talked about, like, the offensive line became a bit of a problem for Carson Wentz, and over the entire season, they allowed 146 total pressures last year. The Seattle Seahawks line allowed 238. So almost 100 more pressures over the year. Um, And it's every single year. I mean, that offensive line, if anything, has been getting worse over the years, despite, you know, coaches brought in to to coach up all these converted defensive linemen and basketball players. They, you know, they, there's just, it's terrible. But it's almost like they've decided that if we put no money and resources into this line, it gives us so much more money and resources to play with in terms of keeping the Legion of Boom and that defense together, you know, being able to keep Richard Sherman and Cam Chancellor and Earl Thomas and Bobby Wagner and Michael Bennett all on the same team for an extended period of time and being able to keep Russell Wilson and, you know, give him some weaponry to play with. It's like, you know, they, they, like I say, they claim it isn't a deliberate strategy, but it appears to be, and it's one that you can't really claim isn't working because it puts them in a position to succeed every single year. And you're in this weird position where you just have to accept that the offensive line is going to be a huge problem that you have to overcome 
with what you're doing. Um, so it, it's a strange situation because you really want to criticize how bad it is, but it's it's like a calculated risk, you know, from the upper levels. Yeah, when you look at Seattle, look, I, I've I've come around to the last couple of years. I don't think there's one right way to win in the NFL, uh, especially offensively. But I do think that there is a strategy that says you can overcome the offensive line if you have either a quick passing game or a guy like Russell Wilson that can you know be a magician back there. So I do think there's this element of look, we've had all of this success with Russell Wilson behind a poor line because it's not like they've ever really had a great line that that protects him. They just were the worst they've ever been last season. So can they just get back to almost, you know, not even average, just not a disaster? Can they get back to not a disaster? Can Luke Jokel hold his own? Do they still trust George Fant? Can he look like a second-year basketball player instead of a first-year basketball player. <laughs> I mean, their best linemen are all centers. Justin Britt at center. He failed at other positions. Very good center. Joey Hunt is like my – I love that guy. He graded well in preseason week one. Undersized little Joey Hunt. He's a very good center. And then Pozik was a center at LSU, but he can play guard or play tackle. So it's all about the centers over there. Um, I will say this. They do a nice job of at least creating movement on double teams in the run game. Um, so like, it's almost like when you leave these guys one-on-one, -on -one, they'll get whooped all the time. When you let them, when they double team in, uh, as, a, as a zone running unit, they'll get some movement. I think that's why, in general, they've had some some success uh, running the ball. I think that's why Thomas Rawls will have some success. I know they added Eddie Lacy. Uh, I think the run game will be, will be back on track this year. I think they've got uh, some runners and, you know, some powerful run blockers, even though they whiff on a number of blocks. So I think the offense is going to be, it's going to end up being okay despite the offensive line. I think the question defensively, can they still get pressure with Bennett and Averill? Do those guys ever, uh, you know, regress, take a step back? Are they uh, ever getting too old? Frank Clark, another guy that they add in there. I mean, I still think they look good up front and, and good on the back end, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's great. It's, it's, it's really the same old Seahawks. They're going to be, Good on offense despite the offensive line. You know, good enough on offense despite the offensive line. The defense should look pretty good. There is a question mark opposite Richard Sherman. I personally think that will be solved by Shaquille Griffin. Shaq. You know, at least sooner rather than later. May, there may be some rookie pains along the way, but I think he could be every bit of Byron Maxwell on that defense pretty quickly. Um, so, yeah, I think it's going to be business as usual for Seattle. I'm really fascinated by the safeties that they've added. Three safeties that I do really like. Bradley McDougal from Tampa Bay, who I've always thought, not a pro bowler or anything, but I, you know, I think he's been one of the more underrated safeties. He's a solid player. And uh, Delano Hill, third round pick. Tedrick Thompson, fourth round pick. Hill is more of that box safety, Cam Chancellor type. Tedrick Thompson, more of a free safety slash slot player that they said they might give a chance to play a little bit of cornerback. So uh, he was our PFF college coverage player of the year last year so they've added some youth to that secondary perhaps because cam chancellor and earl thomas have gotten hurt a little bit these last couple of years so they've added some depth back there so seahawks still we should have just said they're the same old seahawks they're the class of the nfc west next is that right pretty much they really are um i love those guys by the way players that you like for no particular reason i have a bunch of those as well i was saying it during the first week of preseason when Benny Cunningham got on the field for the the, uh, the Bears now. Benny Cunningham is a guy that, for no good reason, I've always quite liked as a player and thought he was pretty good. David Mayo. Is your yes, guy. although that was for a reason. I thought he played well. Because he played so, well. not in preseason. Oh, Benny Cunningham is just a no reason at all for you? Pretty much, yeah. There was no real good reason that I liked Benny Cunningham. That's a more hard-hitting analysis from Sam. I just like <laughs> Benny Cunningham and his name. Just because. No, like that's as good as you like with Bradley McDougal. He's not very good. I just like him. He makes a lot. You know what? It's probably he just makes a lot of plays in the games that I watch that I grade. Makes a lot of plays. Misses some, too. All right, let's move on. NFC West, second place last year. The Arizona Cardinals, 7-8 and 1. They tied the Seahawks. What was it? 6-6 six to six on Sunday Night Football? That game was oh, ugly. No, no, no. missed field goals. and What an ugly game. Don't Arizona, bring that back. Yeah, it was a rough one. Arizona Cardinals, a team that they just have a lot of they just have a lot of things going on that I 
want to see unfold this year. We talked about Eli Manning and his getting old. Carson Palmer is even older than Eli. And just a fascinating career for Palmer. His regression last year from MVP-like season in 2015, I think should have been predictable. If you look at his entire career, 2015. I mean, it was. We did. And we did predict it. I mean, it's if you look at his entire career, every single year-to-year grade, minus the years that he you know played injured or missed a lot of time, he was between 75.9 in 83.9 in our 0 to 0 to 100 grades all a part of PFF edge. So between about 76 and 84. That's a that's a solid NFL starting quarterback. And then all of a sudden in 2015 it's a 93. And that 93 includes those disastrous games the last about 4 weeks of the season. Week 60 and 17, divisional round, conference championship, whether it was his finger injury or not, I mean, it was a disaster. But he was a 93 even despite those terrible games at the end of the season. But Carson Palmer has always been a guy, I think, can make your special throws, can get the ball down the field. You give him a clean pocket, he is one of the better quarterbacks in the NFL. He's always really struggled with pressure, and the thing that he did differently in 2015, he just went on this roll of it didn't matter. Dudes are hitting him in the stomach, and he's still making incredible throws. That was just not – that was the part that really wasn't sustainable when you look at our our data and our numbers. Now you're talking about a guy, this could be his last season – I just think he's still capable in any given year to, you know, get the ball down the field to your Larry Fitzgeralds, to your John Browns, J.J. Nelsons of the world. This offense can still create a lot of big plays. Of course, they have David Johnson in the backfield as well. And then we'll talk about the defense in a second because I am just fascinated by what they're doing with all of the versatile playmakers they are bringing there. Give me your thoughts on Arizona's chances this year. Yeah, we talked about it a bit yesterday that that season from Palmer really was ridiculous. I mean, it, it didn't get as much love as it should have gotten because the raw stats didn't look as good because, you know, it was such a high risk offense that there were some interceptions in there and, you know, there were people who put up more yardage and had better completion percentages and all that kind of thing. But when you look at what Palmer was actually doing, and the kind of the expected outcome of that kind of offense versus the actual outcome that Carson Palmer had with those throws, it was just insane. Like there is no, it was a genuinely unbelievable season. One of the best we've seen in 10 years of grading a PFF and one of the most unexpectedly excellent in terms of, like I say, the, the difference between what you would expect the guy to end up with given what he was asked to do and what he actually ended up with. Um, leaving aside the fact that it was such a deviation from his career baseline, it was just a genuinely phenomenal year. And yeah, we did predict it to, to be a regression. There was no way that was going to be sustained long term. And he came crashing back down to earth pretty dramatically last year. Um, but this is, I mean, that's the guy we saw last year is kind of Carson Palmer. That's the guy that he's been every year except that ridiculous 2015 season. Right. That's probably the guy you're going to get this year as well. Um, and then it's just a case of, what else the rest of the team can do. And David Johnson is huge for that offense in the same way as Le'Veon Bell is huge for the Pittsburgh offense. He's a genuine matchup problem. Um, the Cardinals, I think, are better or at least more keen to take advantage of his matchup problem properties than the Steelers are with Le'Veon Bell. You know, the Cardinals will actually use David Johnson legitimately as a wide receiver. They'll throw him wide receiver routes in, in the way that the Pittsburgh Steelers don't really do with Le'Veon Bell. So, you know, Johnson is a real big key for that offense. And then, you know, the receivers are good enough. They're good enough to be uh, to make some plays within that offense, especially deep down the field, given the speed they still have in pretty much everybody except Larry Fitzgerald. Um, yeah, the offense, I think, should be reasonably good. It, it's just a case of, you know, they're another team where, the offensive line has been a problem for them. Um, they've they got bitten by injuries pretty badly last year. There, it's kind of a case of what they can patch up this year. Yeah, like I said with Palmer, the 2015 anomaly, he was incredible under pressure. But every other year of his career, a below average quarterback. He is just the classic. It's not. It's not a cliche to say that he's good in a clean pocket and not good when he's pressured because we know that every quarterback has at least some drop-off. But we're talking about Palmer being one of the best quarterbacks in a clean pocket, but one of the worst when pressured historically. So that's why that offensive line 
is so crucial. They need to see a huge step forward from a guy like DJ Humphreys at left tackle. Uh, you know, having Jared Valdir for an entire season, I think, would certainly help on the other side. Uh, but certainly some question marks on that offensive line, which they did not do uh, a ton as far as just bringing in new personnel this season. Let's talk about the defense because they lose Calais Campbell. I almost don't care. He was, I mean, he was their clear only real playmaker, just consistent playmaker on the defensive line last year, dominant as a pass rusher, nine sacks, 15 QB hits, 32 hurries, what he does every year, great run defender. But now you've got a guy like, if, if things fall into place for them, Robert Kemdiche in, sec, in, the, in year two, by all accounts, looking pretty good so far. They draft Hassan Reddick in the first round, who played defensive end in college, playing more of a linebacker role now. He can rush the passer. He brings some versatility. Everybody's been looking for the next Dayon Buchanan in the draft every year. The safety that you turn into a linebacker, what he is basically is a below-average run defender at linebacker, but an above-average coverage linebacker, but it's an interesting player. Chandler Jones, Marcus Golden, two guys who have created pretty good pressure off the edge. Chandler Jones, of course, they traded for him last year. All of these fascinating moving pieces, and then in the secondary, Tyron Matthew, your free safety slash slot hybrid, and they drafted a clone in Buda Baker, free safety slash cl uh, slash slot. They have all these movable chess pieces on defense. I can't wait to see how they're deployed. If nothing else, it's going to be fun to watch. Yeah, it is. I, I think a lot rests on the shoulders of Robert Kemdiche. Um They drafted him to be, I guess, to be Calais Campbell's replacement. It probably happened sooner than they maybe were expecting it, um, but that's what he's there for, and now he's going to actually have to do it pretty quickly. Um, I don't know if he's if he's there yet. You know, we've seen very little from him as a rookie. Didn't really get on the field much. Um, we've seen 43 snaps from him now in two preseason games this year. 26 pass rushing snaps. Has got no sacks, no hits, two hurries, which is it's actually a slight positive grade because of exactly how the hurries came, but it's not the kind of dominant interior rusher that you expect. Um, you know, they need him to generate a reasonable amount of interior pressure because Calais Campbell generated a monster amount of interior pressure. So even if they don't replicate that entirely, they've got to go some way towards um, towards supplanting that. I just don't know if Ken is going to be that guy. Um it is a really interesting defense, though, with this sort of sequence of uh, movable chess pieces and guys that fit multiple positions, especially when you have like more than one of them in the same defense with, you know, Matthew and Buda Baker. And if you're going to try and get those guys on the field at the same time, it, it's a really interesting roster that they're putting together. I, I think we talked about the number two cornerback in Seattle, in Washington, yeah. Arizona. Big problem there. This might be the biggest one. You know, when when you looked at the cornerback class in the draft, I kept saying Arizona, get that number two corner, get that number two corner. Before Sidney Jones got hurt, Washington cornerback, I thought he would have been a perfect fit, middle of the first round for them. They didn't they didn't really address it. So you're talking about Patrick Peterson, one of the best pure man to man corners in the entire NFL, on a team that loves to play man to man and match him up against opposing top receivers. Patrick Peterson on one side, but opposite him, Justin Bethel who is a special teams ace, historically. That's what he is, a great special teamer, an ace, and uh, has struggled at covering other humans as a cornerback. You have Brandon Williams, 2016 third-round pick, who is a converted running back and looks very much like a converted running back. He is not ready to play at all. Uh, Tremont Williams is in the mix, who's had some success throughout his career, but I don't think you're necessarily relying on him, and there's not much else. I mean, this could be as fun and versatile as this defense is. If you can't cover anybody opposite Peterson, this is a major issue, I think, for Arizona. Well, the bottom line is that the two guys that are really in competition to start opposite Patrick Peterson have both been benched in the past when they've been starting opposite Patrick Peterson. So you're basically saying, <laughs> okay, clean slate, let's try that again, everybody. You know, let's go again, take it from the top. Um, we'll just hoping, hope you get better this yeah, time. Yeah, exactly. We'll, we'll be fine. And hoping that between take one and take two, those guys will actually become legitimate starting cornerbacks, which is 
probably not the case. Um, I think Tremont Williams is probably the best guy they could put out there, to be honest. I think so, if, too. He's had some success in his yeah. career. I mean, his thing is if he can stay you know, healthy on the field and how badly he's aged, given you know the, the, his his age at this point. But I would be an awful lot more confident in Tremont Williams out there than either of those two guys. Um, I, I love that they have Tyvon Branch back there, too. Who remember a couple of years ago you were writing about how he was the the Gronk, Gronk killer. killer, right? He was the he was the movable chess piece a few years back for the Raiders. He's about forty years old now, but uh, he was the guy that played a little safety, would cover tight ends, would cover the slot. They just have a bunch of safety slot hybrids now in, in that secondary, and they don't have a, a number two cornerback that they can trust. And then even going forward, you've got a guy like Hassan Reddick, who is his own kind of movable chess piece. Is he a linebacker? Is he an edge rusher? Um, he's probably going to be a bit of both for, for the, the Cardinals and a big part of trying to get more pressure up front because, like I say, a lot is resting on the shoulders of Kent Beach at the moment. So the more pressure they can get from Chandler Jones, from Hassan Reddick, from Marcus Golden, the less the Kent DJ needs to get. There might not be a defense that I look at more closely just as far as how they deploy these players. It's going to be fascinating this season. Uh, any hope for the Cardinals this year to kind of get back to that 2015 status where they were a legitimate Super Bowl contender? No, because that rest, it just rested so much on the shoulders of that completely ridiculous Carson Palmer season. Uh, I, I really think that was, that was their year. You know, it was a one shot deal that this team was, a, was almost a team of destiny riding the wave of just a ridiculous run from a quarterback. It was their, New York Giants 2011 season and they just fell short. They couldn't, you know, Palmer injured his thumb and had a meltdown in the playoffs and they just couldn't keep it going. But that was their Giants 2011 year and I just don't see them getting back there. So no faith in the Cardinals. We, we hate every team this year except the uh, upstart Eagles. Let's go to the Los Angeles Rams. Only two more teams to get through. We're getting into some pretty good detail here in our NFC preview with the Rams We've got Jared Goff heading into year two at quarterback. We've got some moving parts on an offensive line that needed a lot of help. We have pretty much a complete overhaul of playmakers the last couple of years, including the Buffalo Bills receiving core. The Buffalo Bills receiving core. Now they just traded for Sammy Watkins. They they uh, they signed Robert Woods this offseason. When I list the playmakers that they've brought in the last two years between free agency trade and the draft, I mean, something's got to give there. Uh, and then defensively, you've got Wade Phillips coming in, new scheme with some with some talent over there. So uh, let's just jump into it. Jared Goff looked bad last year, but so did everyone else around him. The scheme was bad. The playmakers were bad. Everybody needs to get better for them to do anything. What are your thoughts on the Rams, especially starting on the offense? Yeah, so trading for the Buffalo Bills receiving core, or at least signing the Buffalo, between trading and signing, they've right. got the Buffalo Bills receiving core, which is interesting because the Buffalo Bills didn't have a particularly good receiving core. Now, I get the Sammy Watkins thing. I, you know, he's been injured. He was an incredibly talented first round pick. There's a lot to like about Sammy Watkins in terms of fresh start. Let's see what he can bring. Can he actually realize that potential? And you know, somebody threw up on Twitter after that trade the comparison of Sammy Watkins versus Julio Jones through the same portion of their career, and they had the same injury. Uh, it was basically uh, similar, comparable. Julio Jones had a bit more production and a bit fewer games. Um, but the point made was that Sammy Watkins could potentially have a lot more in the tank in the same way that Julio Jones has taken off and become the best receiver in the game. I don't think Sammy Watkins can get there, but if he can get anywhere near that or at least take that kind of step forward, it's a trade well worth making for the Rams. Um, Robert Woods makes less sense to me because I just don't really see what he brings to that receiving core that a guy like Cooper Cup, who they drafted in the third round, doesn't. Um, I've always thought of Woods as like a 2.5 receiver. He's not really a number two. I don't know yeah. if they completely relegate him to a number three, but I mean he's a number two on one of the worst receiving cores in the league, I think, and I think that's exactly. Fair. Whereas you've got a, a guy like Cooper Cup, who I would I would bet could be a number two straight off the bat, and then it's just a case of finding the slot guy on that roster, who between Farrow Cooper, 
Tavon Austin. They should have guys that can do that. So I just don't really see, I don't really see the purpose in Robert Woods. You know what I mean? It just seems like a move that didn't need to be made and cost them quite a bit of money to do. Um, Nelson Whitworth. Spruce. Too. Oh, poor old Nelson Spruce. The dude was like a monster last preseason. They got injured and it's now buried like number 56 on the depth chart. It's a fascinating and, group of playmakers because they got our boy Mike Thomas as well from Southern oh, Miss. who Went and got himself suspended or something, didn't he, though? Yeah, it, but we also had high expectations for him. You mentioned Damn, Farrow Mike. Cooper. Farrow Cooper ran an unbelievable slant the other day, showed off his shiftiness and quickness. It's like... It's kind of a sneaky receiving core where if, if, if these guys tap into their potential, it's not bad. Yeah, I mean, honestly, There's if I was guys. yeah, if I was designing this receiving core, it would be Sammy Watkins, number one, Cooper Cup is your number two, and Farrow Cooper becomes your, your slot guy. Um, and Josh Tavon Reynolds Austin. is a pretty good, you know, deep guy, contested yeah. catch guy, and, and with a little bit of speed, I think you make him, you know, the guy that you just take some shots to. And as much money as you've given Tavon Austin, I just think he's a gimmick guy. He just isn't a wide receiver in the NFL. He's right. a guy that you can throw some gimmick jet sweeps to and stuff, but he's never going to be anything more than that, I don't think. Um, the biggest move they made, though, was Andrew Whitworth coming over at free agency, who, despite being like 127 years old, is still one of the best pass-protecting left tackles in the NFL and just makes a huge difference to that team. And the other, the other really interesting move was signing John Sullivan, who is not that far removed from being one of the best centers in the game. Well, now, I was middle about to say, look, when I, I'm looking at it on paper, right? Rob Havenstein, Roger Saffold, both projected to play guard, both of them solid players. You just mentioned John Sullivan. If he comes back from the dead, Andrew Whitworth maintains his production at 127 years old. Is this a sneaky good offensive line all of a sudden? Yes. I mean, this could be, this could, this line could be fine, which for the Rams is a huge improvement. I mean, you know, they're going from a guy, the left tackle shouldn't be a problem at all. So Goff no longer has to worry about his blind side the way you would have to worry consistently about your blind side when, um, Greg Robinson was your left tackle. So that alone is a huge thing. Like I say, John Sullivan isn't that far removed from being one of the best centers in the game. Now, the time in between is injuries and not playing. So there's a lot of water that has passed under the bridge since then. But it isn't that long ago that we're talking about this guy as being one of the best centers out there. So you could suddenly have created a line that is pretty decent and good in the right areas, um, which is, I think, as important as being pretty decent just across the board. And so that suddenly sets Jared Goff up. Again, like we said with Carson Wentz, there's no excuses anymore. You know, you've got guys around you that can help. It's not the, yeah, but look what he was dealing with thing. Jared Goff now should be able to go out there and show us what he actually has. And we haven't even mentioned the two tight ends that they've drafted the last two years. Tyler Higby, who may have been the best receiving option in the 2016 draft. And then Gerald Everett, second round pick this past year closer to a pure wide receiver than he is a tight end he is he's people have made jordan reed comparisons to him you can kind of see that with the way he moves and his shiftiness we liked him quite a bit coming out they have a lot of a lot of potential playmakers for Goff. i want to see what his development looks like this season uh with the new scheme with the new system and all that fun stuff what about todd Gurley? does he have a bounce back season because the stuff that we were seeing from him last year, like quite apart from the lack of production, the fact that there was no, you know, big plays or anything, more the stuff you were seeing in on film was worrying. Like there was some Trent Richardson in there in terms of running down blind alleys and, you know, passing up perfectly open holes to try and do something crazy and getting nowhere. Like his vision was a legitimate issue. Look, I've only seen that happen once before, and it was Trent Richardson. I, that that just scares the crap out of me. Look, I I think it was a legit issue. The offensive line wasn't good. There's no doubt about it. But I think Todd Gurley. It goes beyond like the yards before contact numbers and yeah. the stats. When you watch Todd Gurley play, you have an inside zone run, and you just you, know, you and I we we've watched hundreds of thousands of inside zone runs, and you just know the way it's supposed to play out, and you're like Todd, you're just not going where the hole is you're just not going where you need to go and it, it actually makes the offensive line look worse now well, we're not necessarily going to grade them worse because you hit the wrong hole but as far as yards before contact or whatever it is it just makes them look worse i think the two things at play here 2015 that season was very 
big play driven. There were just a lot of pa- like plays where he just ran in a straight line, picked up a 40 yard gain. Everybody's like, look at explosive Todd Gurley. I I expected more from him even in that rookie season, which was just accentuated by those big plays. Almost 60 percent of his yards came off those big plays. And then last year was a step back. The offensive line was bad, but he was also bad. It is very concerning. I liked him a lot coming out. He should be a lot better, but forget the physical skills. He needs to see the game better than he than he was last season. So here's my concern. Everybody's known for years that a bad offensive line can effectively break a quarterback. Um, David Carr is the great example of that. You know, expansion Houston Texans just destroyed by the amount of pressure they put on the number of times he was sacked over his first few years. I think most people have, uh, happily accept that David Carr had a lot of talent and the Texans basically broke it. By the end of his time there, he, you know, was phantom pressure everywhere, just couldn't stay in a pocket. It was, you know, it just ruined his career essentially. And another good example of that, I think, is actually with the Rams and Mark Bulger, who had a fantastic couple of seasons replacing Kurt Warner, was the reason the Rams moved on from Kurt Warner. And then the offensive line completely broke down around him. And eventually Mark Bulger, like Mark Bulger's signature play that will live on past him is the, the throw and cower in the one move, you know, releasing the ball and immediately curling up into the fetal position because you know you're about to get destroyed. That's how I'd be throwing from a, <laughs> from a busy but, pocket. But again, like pressure eventually broke Mark Bulger and he, he couldn't be the guy that he was before. It never really occurred to me until Trent Richardson and now Todd Gurley that the same thing could potentially happen to a running back. And if you've got just this disaster of an offensive line, eventually you get the same thing. The running back equivalent of feeling pressure on every single play, you're just expecting the block to break down and you're no longer confident in the hole that's opening up in front of you. And instead you're trying to find something better. You're basically looking for the giant wide open highway that you can run down that's never never really going to materialize. So you, you take this inside zone run and you've got the hole that's that's designed there, but you know, maybe there's a twitch out of the block from the right guard and suddenly you think, no no, he's losing that. I've got to bounce it outside and you just walk into a blind alley and you get you get yourself into trouble. And I think that's what happened with Trent Richardson. And I wonder if that's happening to Todd Gurley. And the thing about that that's really scary is that I'm pretty sure it's a one way thing for quarterbacks. I don't, I can't think of any quarterback that has repaired themselves from that, that has unbroken themselves from being destroyed by an offensive line. I don't know if there's a way back for a running back. Man, that is a interesting theory, Sam, and definitely something I'll be taking a, a close look at with Gurley. Can he bounce back? I still think he has the, you know, when you look it's at him. sarcastic as hell. What an interesting theory you got there, Sam. No, I, I like that. No, no. I was trying to sound enthusiastic, not <laughs> sarcastic. So, I don't know. I'm going to get better at that, maybe. Yeah. I am fascinated by it. Here's the difference between him and Trent, though. Trent, had, he was supposed to be this athletic guy. I think Gurley still has the physical ability. So Agreed. Let's see if he could bounce back there or use him in the pass game a little bit more, I think would be a great way to get him involved. Defensively, I know they have the best defensive player in the NFL, Aaron Donald, right up there with J.J. Watt, uh, when Watt is healthy as the best defensive player in the NFL. Everybody's saying, well, Wade Phillips is bringing in a 3-4. Aaron Donald can't play in a 3-4. Look, he's going to be playing the same exact position. He's going to be playing over the guard, which is a position that Wade Phillips has in his scheme. Aaron Donald will be absolutely fine. I'm more worried about the pieces around him. They lose William Hayes, who has quietly been one of the most underrated defensive ends in the entire NFL. Dominic Easley, once again, hurt. Another knee injury, the third big one of his career. They're not really loaded in the front seven. Uh, so I think the defense will be okay and, and just kind of hoping that Uncle Wade uh, makes them just a little bit better schematically. Yeah, so if you Google um, why the Ram scheme change won't affect Adam Donald, you will actually find a an article on Pro Football Focus that I wrote uh, back in February, um, basically detailing exactly what you're saying, that Donald is going to end up in exactly the same position as he's been playing all the way along. There's an image in that that actually overlays uh, a front four look from Denver against a front four look from the Rams. The Denver Broncos are essentially uh, ostensibly in a 3-4 because one of those edge guys is rushing from a two-point stance. 
and the Rams are in a four-man line, but they are literally in the exact same spots as in terms of def- defensive line technique. You've got one guy in the, the one technique spot between the, the guard and the center. You've got a three technique, which is your Aaron Donald outside of the guard. And then you've got two edge rushers that in this particular instance are out wide because it's a, a third and long, I think. Um, but basically Donald's going to be in exactly the same place. So the key becomes everybody else because Donald has been this one man show for the Rams for a few years. And it's a case of what they can put around him. I really like, uh, Tanzo Smart that they brought in. I thought he had a really good preseason game as well. Looked extremely disruptive. I, he should. Nice senior would, bowl and every, we liked him quite a bit coming out as well. Yep. Yeah. I would think he could easily, I mean, he won't start, I think because, um, because of Donald and because of Brockers, but I think he'll get a pretty healthy rotation quite quickly and could make some serious impact as a, um, a sub package guy for them. The question for them, I think is the secondary. It's moving backwards where I, we've talked a lot about number two corners. And I think they have a similar issue. They've got Kayvon Webster, the cornerback brought over from Denver, who was, was one of the guys that wasn't in that top three corners in Denver that everyone thought were fantastic. He was a guy that was always passed over for those three, but has shown like flashes of talent. Um, and then the next guy in that depth chart is our favorite, Troy Hill, who has had struggles in the NFL. Let's just say that. Um, but it, so again, you've got, you've got a deal of, uh, of trying to find players in that secondary that can go along with Tremaine Johnson, who himself is it's not like Tr- Tremaine Johnson sets the world alight. He's pretty solid. Um, cornerback, but probably not much beyond that. Yeah, so, so so plenty of question marks on the Rams' defense as well. Do they at least improve a little bit? With all those pieces they've added on offense, Jared Goff can't be as bad as he was last season, right? They're going to move at least a little bit forward. Yeah, the offense has to be better. I, I think it may take a bit of, like, there may be some teething trouble there, and we may, it may take them a while to kind of figure out exactly what their best lineup is and exactly what their best offense looks like, but I think that should progress into a pretty solid offensive offensive unit, and then it's just a case of whether that defense can get any better. Um, there hasn't been a whole lot added to it, um, but with Smart being, I think, the one notable exception as a guy that's going to make something of a, an impact in year one, but the shit, you know, so I don't know if that unit is going to get dramatically better, but the offense definitely should. Let's wrap it up in this marathon episode with the San Francisco 49ers last place last year in the NFC West had the number two overall pick going into the draft traded back to number three one of my favorite drafts of the 2017 draft which was Solomon Thomas in the first round Reuben Foster in the first round two very solid defensive pieces another good defensive piece in the third round Akello Witherspoon and some sleeper fifth rounders you have uh T- at tight end friend of the George, show George Kittle friend of the show uh, did you interview him was it you that, that did it back yeah. around uh, around draft time yeah so one of the better blocking and uh, you know move tight ends in the draft and then Trent Taylor a guy that they were really high on before the draft uh, little slot receiver that I think is going to be a pretty good player uh, that was an important draft for a team that doesn't have a lot of talent. Did not have a lot of talent last year anywhere on the roster. New coaching staff. Kyle Shanahan's there. John Lynch is a GM. Our own Bobby Slowick is coaching linebackers over there. PFF's own Bobby Slowick returning to the coaching ranks in San Francisco. What are you looking at for the 49ers this year? I hope you have your Brian Hoyer splits handy because that is one of the best stats that we have. Bobby. Bobby Hoyer. Um, oh, Bobby. Yeah, so that's uh that's obviously the biggest improvement they made. They've they've added some PFF to their staff with Bobby uh, Slowick, so can't can't be worse. Got to be Forty Niners, congrats. Um, I think you're right. I think this was an incredibly important draft for them, and there was more than a little luck involved in how exactly that fell. Um, with Solomon Thomas and then Reuben Foster slipping that far, but I think that's an absolute jackpot for them. Thomas looks exactly like the kind of player that you can build around on that defense. And I think he's versatile enough that it, it enables them to get the previous two first round picks to Forrest Buckner and Eric Armstead on the field at the same time. He's the guy I think that has the versatility that makes the other two viable. You know, if he wasn't 
as versatile as he is, I think you would struggle to get those three guys on the field at the same time. But I think Thomas is the guy that's going to enable him to let it happen. Ruben Foster is just that complete all-round linebacker. He's the next Navarro Bowman, which is just as well, because I think Navarro Bowman is probably, you know, he's not going to get back to the all-pro that he was. Just the injuries have just hit too hard and too many. Right. Um, but they've, you know, when you think of that linebacker run that they've had in terms of Patrick Willis and then Patrick Willis and Navarro Bowman and now Bowman to Ruben Foster, and each one of those is going to have overlapped a little bit. That's a phenomenal kind of run of inside linebackers. You they've forgot. Had there. You forgot one linebacker. Did I forget? Chris Borland, man. Oh, Borland. Damn it, yeah. That's an that's a ridiculous run of picking linebackers. A had. phenomenal, phenomenal 2014 rookie and final season, 487 snaps. When you consider the Giants haven't been able to find a linebacker in the past 15 years, and the 49ers have like got a sequence of four of them in the same length of a career. 11-248. Borland had a dominant, what is it, four, six, nine games. He was incredible. Love that guy. Then he retired. Carry on. Yeah, well, I mean, those two guys. Foster's potentially a fantastic player. I thought he was a top five defensive player in the draft. Everybody talks about the diminishing value of the linebacker. I disagree. When you get a linebacker that can affect the pass game, and the run game, the way Reuben Foster can, I think that's worth a top 10 type of pick. So I, I like where they're going. Uh, there's still a long way to go, but Shanahan and Lynch have long-term contracts. They have time to build this thing up. Uh, Brian Hoyer at the helm, re- reuniting with Kyle Shanahan, who was the offensive coordinator for him back in 2014 with the Cleveland Browns. Hoyer... I keep saying this. I've been on uh, San Francisco radio a couple times over the last few weeks, and I, I, I told 49ers fans there's going to be this point in about week six or seven where the thought's going to cross your mind, maybe Brian Hoyer's the guy. Maybe he is the future. You know, he's working well with Shanahan, and he's really outperforming what we expected. And then right around Halloween, he might crush your dreams. So just be ready, 49ers fans. You're going to... You're going to feel those emotions at some point this season, I think. Yeah, I think my Brian Hoyer stat sheet is currently on a boat in the middle of the Atlantic. But it's, you're right. It's, it's Halloween is the date, about week 10, every single year. His career splits from pre-week 10 to post-week 10 are ridiculous. I mean, absolutely farcical. He is a legitimate quarterback for the first 10 weeks of the season throughout his NFL career. All, every single number is better. Touchdowns thrown, touchdown percentage, interception percentage, yards, yards per attempt, passer rating, completion percentage, everything. And he looks actually legitimately okay as a, a quarterback before Halloween. And then I don't know if the candy gets to his brain or something happens. He turns into week, Bobby Hoyer. At week 10, he turns into Bobby Hoyer and the, the train rolls off the tracks completely. And it just, it's a disaster. I mean, the guy, from week 10 onwards, cannot play in the NFL. But everything prior to that point, you're fine. So you know, the 49ers, if they want to they want to succeed long-term this year, their job is to get somebody ready for week 10 because, oh, Bobby is going to surface. Well, Matt Barkley had that short burst of uh, competence last year, too. Maybe you piece it all together like the Bears did last season. Wait, that got the Bears the third overall pick, so maybe not. Look, I think the 49ers fans this year, look at those young guys. Look at DeForest Buckner and his development, Solomon Thomas, Reuben Foster, all of these guys that we mentioned. I think that's your focus for this year. Come out of this year saying, hey, we've got all these pieces to be a part, to be a big part of this rebuilding process and continue to add in the draft. You're going to be looking at quarterbacks in the draft next year. So watch a lot of Pac-12 football. Go go listen to our 2018 NFL Draft Prospect Podcast. It's a couple podcasts ago here on the Pro Pod uh, where we broke those guys down. I think that's what 49ers fans are doing this season. Just kind of take it in, enjoy the new scheme, enjoy one of the best play callers in the entire NFL in Kyle Shanahan, and just kind of have your eyes toward the future. Uh, Yeah, I really don't think that this team is going to be that bad this year. I mean, I'm not saying they're going to contend or or they're going to have even a winning record, but I don't think they're going to be in danger of that number one overall pick next year. In fact, I don't think they're going to be particularly close to it. I think this could easily be a five, six, even a seven win team um, and actually look pretty capable. But it's all about, it is all about the rebuilding. You know, they're, 
this year is not going to be their year. It's a case of how good they can get for 2018 and beyond. And obviously the first thing they need to do is find a long-term answer quarterback this next offseason. But I think that defense could end up being okay. They have a big problem, not just a number two cornerback, but potentially a cornerback period. Um, Rashad Robinson is their, their number one guy. And he definitely flashed as a rookie, but you know, that's a lot to ask in year two for him to suddenly eliminate all the problems and be a complete cornerback. Um, and the offense, <laughs> leaving the, the Bobby Bryant Hoyer thing aside, there's a lot of question marks there as well. Pierre Garçon, I think, has been an extremely good receiver the past couple of years. You know, one of those really good, uh, better, pure possession guys that you were saying. After him, it's a bit of a mismatch and a bit of a collection of guys. that Somebody else needs to step up. The offensive line is definitely a group in flux and a group that needs to come together and try and find out where the holes are and what they actually need to build on. But, you know, a guy like George Kittle, I think, will be productive in year one. They've got some weapons there. That, I think, is going to have more teething troubles than the defense. If you're trying to visualize what this defense is going to look like, they are incorporating that Seattle Seahawks-like scheme, cover one, cover three, you play some press man coverage. You play some uh, more off cover three, where you where you kind of match up uh, with a with the opposing routes. If you want to just kind of put some pieces in place and what they might look like, Solomon Thomas. Uh, the hope I think is that he becomes their Michael Bennett, the guy that they can move around that defensive front and create havoc from the interior. Ruben Foster perhaps becomes their Bobby Wagner, the guy that you can put in the middle of the defense that can cover that crosser against cover three, the kryptonite to the cover three scheme. Uh, Foster can do it. He can run. He can do all those things. And maybe your boy Rashad Robinson with that long frame becomes the Richard Sherman over there at left cornerback. Uh, I'm not saying it's all going to happen, but I'm just trying to visualize maybe what they're looking at. Maybe it is Akella Witherspoon, who again, six foot two plus, really good movement skills coming out of Colorado, still relatively young at the position, just had a fantastic season. Uh, opponents were three for 30 trying to target him on deep balls last year. At, at Colorado, not good. So it's not good at all because the guy can cover and he can make plays on the ball. So, uh, you know, again, I'm, I'm not saying that they're going to be first pick overall. T- I'm, I'm kind of with you too. I think they're going to sneak some wins, but it's still, I don't think they're contending for the playoffs. So no. I think it's still this rebuilding season where Niners fans are just saying, okay, where do these guys fit into the future? Let's have some uh, positivity moving forward as part of this rebuild. Yeah, I agree. I think, like I say, I don't think this is going to be a bad football team this year. It's it's going to have – it's definitely on a rebuilding path, but I think the trajectory is only up, and not just because they've got Bobby Slow. We went for oh about an hour – over an hour and a half discussing. We gave you guys too much information, but that's what we do here. We hope you enjoyed it. That is just the NFC East and West breakdowns. We'll be back later for some more NFL breakdowns. If you're an AFC fan – Check out those two podcasts. We split them into East and West and North and South. Don't forget about our offer from Draft. Find them in the App Store. Use the promo code PFF. Get your free $3 game. And that'll do it for us today. Don't forget to get to ProFootballFocus.com. Check out our fantastic new products, PFF Edge and PFF Elite. Edge is only $40 and Elite is the best of what we offer for right about $200. Everything you guys need for fantasy season right now, and it's much more than fantasy. You'll also get our player grades. You'll also get all of our NFL draft content, every single draft guide that we put out last year's, this year's preseason guide, this year's postseason guide. You will be all set up for that when you sign up. So be sure to check those out. Throw them into the Google machine. Search PFF Edge or PFF Elite. It'll take you right to the page thanks again guys for listening in and please stay tuned for even more previews and then some preseason reaction after week two we'll talk to you guys next time